Hi, this is Matt Garcia, uh, Utah State Beef Specialist again. Uh, this is our second installment of our uh, Beef Producer Educator Program. And today I'm just going to be talking about uh, the first card that we actually had developed. Uh, if you remember, we started developing these, these business cards for producers uh, to carry around, uh, help educate the public. And this is our, our first card that we actually developed a couple months ago. And it's uh, a card entitled Hormones and Beef in Everyday Foods. And one of the reasons that we decided to develop this card uh, first is one of the, the big things we hear from uh, consumers or ex-consumers is that they're concerned with the fact that uh, we use growth promotants or hormones uh, in our beef animals. Now, part of that is the fear that these hormones are going to alter, you know, physiological function, you know, cause girls to go into puberty earlier, things like that. But the reality is um, that the growth hormones that we use and the concentrations that we use in our animals, our beef animals, and the reasons we use these are very different from what the public actually knows. Now, if you look at, at this card, for example, it has a list of different foods and their normal estrogenic activities. There are normal hormone activities that are or concentrations that are that are in these foods. You know, beef, for example, an implanted steer has seven nanograms um, of, of estrogenic compound in it. Where soy flour or toy, tofu has 755 million and 113.5 million nanograms in it. So the, the concentration in beef is completely irrelevant compared to tofu, pinto beans, white bread, peanuts, and all these concentrations are in this card right here for you to see. And these have actually been documented by USDA, uh, you know, Shore and Shemesh uh, in 2003, a, a scientific peer-reviewed study, as well as Hoffman and Eversoll and Hartman and Associates, uh, you know, multiple... Uh, peer-reviewed scientific manuscripts documenting the evidence that hormone concentrations in other foods, naturally occurring hormone concentrations, are exponentially and significantly higher than what we have in, in beef cattle. Now, one of the big arguments is that the, the estrogenic activity or the estrogenic compounds in, in plants are phytoestrogens. Now, basically, phytoestrogens are just exogenous estrogens, estrogens that are produced outside the body that you ingest and or, or you put into your body externally and they have an effect. You know, that's the same thing as the implants that we're using in our beef cattle. They're exogenous estrogens. Now, the other thing that people, one of the misinformation that the public has in terms of why we use these compounds um, is typically they, they think that we're, we're using these, these compounds to generate these huge bodybuilder, overly muscled types, types of cattle. And the reality is that we're actually use, utilizing these growth promotants and in, at time points during the production cycle when we, we know animals are going to get stressed, we know animals are going to go off feed. And what these growth promotants actually do, I actually refer to them as growth sustainers. Now, part of the thing that they do is we, we give them, you know, a lot of times in our preconditioning programs, our weaning programs, they'll get them when they enter the feedlot. And the idea is that this implant not only uh, helps these animals grow, but it, it, by implanting it, it helps them become more vigorous, helps them, you know, to, it increases appetite. These animals are going to eat. They're going to walk around. They're not going to lay down. They're not going to get depressed. They're not going to get sick, more than likely, if they have these implants. These implants also aren't going to make these animals extremely large. And the reason I call them growth sustainers is because these animals get these and they're more vigorous and more likely to eat and not lay down during these time periods, they're less likely during these times of stress, you know, weaning, entering the feedlot, you know, th th these times, they're actually going to continue their growth curve. Animals that don't receive this, that are stressed, that get sick, you know, when they hit these, these stressful time points, they actually, their gain stops, which means that producers have to invest more in getting these animals, you know, to gain and go forward. You know, so it's almost a efficiency 
model, but it's also an animal welfare model to keep these animals healthy, eating, growing, so that they remain healthy throughout the growth from, throughout the beef production system. Now, with that, you know we have some information about you know why we actually utilize these, and that's something we need to be telling the public. You know, we're we're not we're not generating these mutant animals. We're doing this to keep these animals healthy, eating, productive, going forward in the production production process. Now, with that being said, um, once again, uh, if you'd like to get a hold of some of these cards, uh, I'll be making some of these some more of these videos uh, going forward for antibiotic use in animals, um, the benefits of grazing, uh, you know, whether it's public lands or private land, and then after seeing some some uh, activists here on campus, I'm going to be generating one a card and a video dealing with uh, animal welfare and handling in the beef production industry. And with that, if you'd like to you know, get a hold of some of these cards, uh, feel free to contact me, matthew.garcia at usu.edu, or give me a call here in the office, 435-797-2144. And uh, I look forward to talking with you more about these topics. And if you have any questions, concerns, uh, suggestions, feel free to contact me. Thank you.